earlier this week, Mike Holland asked me to find a way time, well, earlier than Thursday, and asked me, and I read about it online, uh, asked me if I would be willing to give an award to someone who I've had the pleasure of working with, not for as long as some people in here, but the history that he brought to one of, our, one of the hardest years for locals has been one that achieved successes, and some that are still achieving current successes through organizing drives that he helped start. And that person is Kevin Lynch. Uh, pretty incredible guy. On a more serious note, 
I, I want to just share a personal story. Uh, 20 years ago, I was a worker in a nonprofit in uh, Lower Manhattan, and uh, I was part of a group of staff who were very frustrated with what was going on in our workplace. And uh, I remember we called up one union, uh, they sent out a staff person, and uh, we just didn't know what the heck this guy was talking about. And we left completely, you know, uh, demoralized. And a friend of mine gave me a recommendation. They said, you know, call this guy Kevin Lynch, and uh, he was then at DC 1707, level 205. And we were a very diverse workforce. Some people were very scared. Um, and, and I remember Kevin came, and he challenged us to step up, but he also stood by us. And everyone, he earned the trust and the respect of everyone there. And he taught us how to move forward. And we did vote to unionize our, 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 you know, our workplace. And it was, you know, as you can imagine, those of you who've been through it, it was an incredibly moving experience. And to see his leadership, uh, for me, it was just uh, was formative for me. And what strikes me about Kevin is that all these, you know, years later, and years before I knew him, Kevin is a person who never stopped organizing workers. We, I'd see him at a meeting in Queens, and he'd say, oh, I, you know, running a little bit late because I was just out organizing, you know, immigrant livery cab drivers, you know, doing these. He never stopped fighting for low-wage workers, folks that people said couldn't be organized. He knew how to organize them, and he went out and figured out a way to help these people build, and build power for themselves with a union. Uh -huh. And, you know, when many people shifted in their career, he never stopped going out day after day. And within the WFP, not only did he serve as a role model, but he also always strove to, to teach us and reteach us a simple lesson about our political project. He always taught us if the thing that really could weaken us and hurt us was that workers are divided. And it sounds like a simple thing, but it comes up over and over again, we know. And, and, and it comes up in our political work. Uh, there's racism, there's sexism, there's the divisions within the labor movement, there's the immigrant workforce and the, and the native workforce, so on and so forth. And Kevin is, for those of you who've been meetings with him, one of the most eloquent voices. He'll always stand up and tell people, hey, wait a second, you're fighting the wrong fight here. Let's be clear who we need to be going after. Let's be clear who our friends are. Let's stand united and we can accomplish great things together and build a better world. And that's what Kevin Lynch, I think, has taught so many of us and why we want to honor him here tonight.
But these immigrants came, like the immigrants that are arriving here today, came with their own background and their own strength. The fact of the matter was that uh, my grandmother used to say with a bit of a laugh, my grandfather left Ireland in a hell of bullets. <laughs> he was uh, on the most wanted list by the British Army. And he taught me many, many lessons. And most of them came down to lessons on how a working person should live a happy life. And the first of those lessons he taught me was, son, you were born to a, a life of struggle. And you can be happy as long as you recognize that. And then you can find happiness in the struggle. And that lesson has stuck with me all my life. And I fought the fact that being a working person in America is a legacy of struggle. Had I fought it, I would have been an unhappy person. I've never been an unhappy person. So I didn't know Michael Hill and the others. I used to go there when they had conventions. They used to bring me in for negotiations uh, when I was a kid. We were a kid running around. And uh, I grew up with others who had similar backgrounds. Uh, the grandsons of James Conklin, the Irish Revolution, none of that. One of the great lessons of the Irish struggle was that we can only depend on ourselves, on the people like us, the common people, the other working people. For 800 years we waited for the French fleet to arrive in the harbor or the Spanish army to the rest of Ireland. And in the final analysis, it was shit and pain. It was ourselves alone that we're going to do the job. And so it is here in America in our lives too. All we can really, really, really get trust in is other working people like ourselves. And it is in the unity of the working people that we defend ourselves and we accomplish great things. Now, now I'm going to skip over one of them. I, I mean, million people that came to Central Park. I was one of six people in the leadership. And all we did in leadership was we talked among ourselves and we said, the best thing we can do is get out of the people's way. They're on the way to New York. If we step out of their way, they're going to take the streets and do a great job just to do So, although I did it, One of the things in the back of my mind is I want to meet with the Occupy Wall Street people because uh, I was in charge of negotiations with the police uh, prior to uh, the million people coming to such a block. And they never believed the million people were coming. <laughs> I kept telling them. <laughs> and, and they kept blowing us off. So they would say, well, we're certainly not going to let you in the park because we just we just planted the grass. <laughs> and no, you can't march on First Avenue. There's an international treaty with the UN that says nobody can march on First Avenue. Imagine that. And they they told us, well, maybe we'll give you one avenue to march on. But two weeks before the rally, the police intelligence found out through. Uh, their investigations that there were dozens of trains having been rented that were on their way to New York City and that every single bus that could be rented on the East Coast was rented and on its way to New York City. And they called the standard panic to the police headquarters and they said, you know what? A million people are coming. <laughs> operations and captain he was uh, what we used to call in the Irish community a tomato bus. You know, there's a guy in the space that was always red, black hair, great fit. And uh, we were trying to coordinate with him back and forth, back and forth. 
So it had gotten bizarre. It really had because, like for instance, we had eight blocks long of people walking on stilts. For the parade, right? We had uh, African American cowboys with their horses coming to the parade. So the, the, the night before, uh, the, the guys, some of you know my reputation, Jimmy Bell and I were over at this in 65, which was the headquarters. And uh, on the whim, I called up the captain. And I said, Captain, we got a problem. It's the sort of last minute problem. He said, oh, well, what is it? I said, well, the Arab, the Arab League is bringing a camel corps and they spit at me. <laughs> what should we do with it? He believed me. <laughs> he was really upset. I found him talking about that's not true. <laughs> but I did tell him that I had gotten his message earlier in the evening about that they had given us permission finally to set up a stage for Pete Seeger from the UN. He said, well, you can set up the stage. I said, well, Captain, that's good because it's already up and it's surrounded by 300 Union security. And that's all we to let everybody be on the program. I got a kid tell you this. I said, in the car. For me. But I do have to do one little thing that I have to tell you. This is very serious. Mm -hmm. Over my lifetime, I have done work, I hope, with some significant with. 16 different unions. 11 of those unions I produced. From the time I was 17 years old to today, and I still today produce the three unions. So from that time to today, I've always paid my union dues. Now this was something I couldn't have gotten away with not doing in my house. That just wasn't what my mother used to say. You know, if you leave the church, you break my heart. But if you cross a picket line, I'll break your leg. <laughs> I learned how to pay what, what pay a dues man when I was 17 years old and I was called down from the Bronx with a couple of other young guys uh, to work on loading ships on the Chelsea Pier at the Long Shore. And, uh, my dues were, I think, $15 a month. But I was getting paid $17 an hour. I was 17 years old. I was getting paid more than my father was getting paid, even though he was a member of the utility workers over at Time Ed. And the second day on the job, my friend Charlie Stewart was learning how to drive a forklift. He didn't have a license to drive anything. And he turned the forklift around sharply and it went right over the pier into the river. I mean, oh my God, we're finished now. They're going to fire all of us. It was really quite graceful. So the, the low of the fall of Charlie sort of gracefully diving into the river. But all they did is take Charlie out and give him injections. Everybody had a good laugh, and the next day we were back on the job. So I knew that I was getting my $15 a month worth. <laughs> There's one organization that I pay news to that you all know. That organization is the Working Families Party. When I first started in the labor world, we used to have to pay your dues by hand. I wouldn't continue to pay by hand. Now I'm lazy, I have a check off from my monthly account, and you can all do that. Getting away with only thirty-five dollars a month, you know, you had enough to in a while. <laughs> you don't have to pay that much either if you're you know retired to much lower. But anyway, it's the same thing that I learned with the youth. It's all about shit, man. If we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't do it by ourselves, it ain't gonna get done. And there's no greater joy than knowing that you pay your dues to an organization that depends you and people like you. So everybody, make sure you pay your dues to work with Thank you very much.
very much.